Thank you very much, uh, Paddy, and thank you very much, Chairman of Inclusion Ireland, Tom Healy, for the invitation to be here today. And, and I, I agree with, with Paddy, and one of the reasons that I was keen to accept the invitation to open this important conference today is on, is on the very basis that you outlined, Paddy. Disability issues can't be siloed, they can't be located in just one department or just one remit of, of ministerial responsibility. There needs to be a whole of government approach because people with disabilities are citizens in this country that operate across our state, interacting with every state agency and every government department. And obviously, you don't need me to tell you, but the issue of finance is clearly a very important one in the delivery of such services. I think it's it's important, and I'd like to, to pick up on the points that you made, Paddy, in your opening comments about how do things slip off a political agenda. Well, let me begin by saying, when I ran for the Dáil in the last general election, I didn't run for the Dáil with the purpose of dying to fulfil Troika commitments, or wanting to be lying awake at night wondering about bond yields, or you know wanting to know, were the EU happy with us today? Or how are our banks getting on? I ran for the doll for a very simple reason. I ran for the doll because my brother, Adam, was born with a condition on the autistic spectrum, um, Asperger syndrome and high functioning autism. And Adam was born and Adam grew up in Celtic Tiger Ireland. Adam went through the education system long before the bust. Adam went through the education system. Adam interacted with society when we were told, when we were lectured, when people were boasting about how we were the wealthiest country in Europe at a time when we had more money than sense. Yet my family, just like so many people in this room and so many people that people in this room will know, had to battle and fight for every single service that Adam required. Now, Adam is incredible. Um, he's super intelligent, twice as intelligent as I am, can absorb information like there's no tomorrow. But his disability was hidden. And my family felt really isolated. Uh, I'd set up an autism group, as I see some friends from Greystones here who will be familiar with this, to, to lobby and to give a voice to families in Wicklow living with autism. And then you get to that point, do you continue to give out and be an armchair general, or do you try to make a difference? And I obviously decided to take the plunge uh, and to run for elected office. But, and this is, I think, the blunt answer to your question, Paddy, when we came to government for the first three years, every single moment of every single hour was dominated by how does the country economically survive? And it's easy to forget now, and it's amazing how quickly we can forget with a 4.5% economic growth in the country. But if you read Pat Leahy's book, The Price of Power, Pat Leahy, the political editor, I don't think that's me, Pat Leahy, the political editor of the Sunday Business Post, talking about how politicians and ministers were wondering would the cupboards actually run bare. If you read newspaper articles from 2011, 2012, and even last year, questions like would the euro would the euro remain? Would we need a second bailout? Was Ireland economically viable? Would we go the way of Greece? So on and so forth. Thank God that is now beyond us. That is now behind us. And this is the first time in my three and a half years in the Dáil where we actually have a space in which to have the conversation that you're endeavouring to recommence. I won't say begin because as you say, it's been going on for a decade, but where we can recommence that conversation where it left off. And I think that's why it's really exciting. I think that's really, why it's really appropriate that you're here today, literally weeks before budget 2015, literally weeks before the government publishes a tax reform plan, not just for this budget, but for the next three years, and a spending reform plan for the next three years. So your timing couldn't be better. We now have a situation where we can move from crisis, from firefighting, to the discussion that I really believe everybody in politics, regardless of their persuasion, wants to have and gets involved to have. What sort of society do we actually want to have? What do we actually want to do with the recovery? If we grow the economy at 3% every year for the next decade, half a decade, what do you do with the benefits of that recovery? And it's within that space I think we have to have that conversation. And I think we have to learn from the past as well. Because to take you back to my own experience, and I'm sure the experiences of many in this room with a disability and many carers and family members of people with disabilities, yes, funding is vital, vital, but it's not all about funding. It's about systems. It's about reform. It's about making sure that the money isn't getting lost in silos or bureaucracy or red tape. It's making sure, as Paddy alluded to, that people with disabilities are making the decision about how the money is spent, rather than decisions being made for them by writing large checks to large organisations, many of which do good work, and telling people with disability to kind of run after the money and find it. We have to learn from those mistakes. I think 
we also have to recognise that the disability debate must be about more than a debate about the social welfare system. I think political classes and, in fact, the media, and at times, to be truthful, representative groups, have perhaps failed to move beyond the superficial debate. Every time there's a general election in this country, and we know we'll have one within the next two years, we have a situation where politician A knocks on your door and says, if you vote for me, I'll give you an extra five euro on the disability allowance. Politician B runs up, up after, I'll give you 650 of an increase. That's a ridiculous debate. It's a superficial debate. The people that I know with disabilities, the people that you know with disabilities, people here with disabilities, yes, they want to know there's a safety net in place. Yes, they want to know there's a system that will support them. And yes, that needs to be funded. And yes, the last number of years have been extremely difficult on that front. But they want, like every citizen in this country, to have an opportunity to work, to have an opportunity to fulfill their potential. So if we're serious about having a discussion about the cost of disability, we have to have a discussion about the cost of not providing people with disabilities the opportunity to enter the workforce, the cost of effectively impoverishing people with disabilities to stay at home, to give them a social welfare gyro, and then for the state to say, fair enough, I've done my bit, sure didn't we give you the social welfare? That's the debate that went on through the Celtic Tiger. We massively, as a state, increased spending on disability services. But we did some crazy things. And these aren't partisan comments because I think, I think the whole system was caught up in it. We massively increased investment in special needs education in this country during the years of boom. But up until last year, we hadn't reviewed special needs education policy since 1993. 20 years passed where we pumped billions into special needs education, the introduction of SNAs, resource hours, ASD units, and nobody actually stopped at any point and said, hey, will we check if this is working? Will we talk to people with disabilities? Will we talk to teachers? Will, will we check? Will we see how we're getting on? It was constantly just a barrage of pumping more funding in. So to summarize that point, Paddy, and, and, and guess, Yes, we have to look at the funding issue. Yes, we clearly have to look at the cost of disability. Yes, we have to and do recognize that people with disabilities have additional costs in going about their lives. But if we only recognize that, we will be doing people with disability and the state a huge disservice because we have to also have a duty to do the harder thing, to recognize that systems need to be reformed. And I think the biggest reform that needs to be made is the issue of how funding for people with disabilities is allocated. And there's a commitment in the programme for government in this regard, and I think it feeds very well into the conversation you're going to have today in relation to the cost of disability. We've given a commitment in the programme for government to move to a system of personalised budgets or individualised budgets, call them what you will. But effectively, rather than taking a service provider and saying we're going to allocate X million to the service provider, and then the person with disability has to go cap in hand looking for a place, which may be suitable, may be part suitable, may be great, may not be suitable at all. Instead of that, you do what they do in many civilized countries in this world, where you actually allocate the funding resource to the person with the disability. So all of a sudden, you're the customer, you're the client, you're the citizen, and you get to choose the service that you want. It does a number of things. And interestingly, from a Department of Finance point of view, I believe it'll save money, which brings me back to the point, increasing funding isn't always the answer to everything, but it will actually allow standards to rise because good services will prosper, bad services will fizzle out, and when people with disabilities aren't happy, they can move to another service. They are in control, like every citizen in this country is in control. That's something, though, and to, to come back to the purpose of this seminar, I think it would be foolish to do that without taking up the challenge that this conference is posing to government this morning, which is before you move to personalised budgets, let's have an honest engagement about what is the cost of having a disability in this country? What are the additional costs that you experience? So I think that's something major. It's something that I want to see. It's something that I'd be very interested in hearing views back from, from individuals and representatives here. But I think personalised budgets is a message that we've learned from the, we've learned from the mistakes of the past. We recognise people with disabilities as full citizens in this country, and we're taking a seismic shift of rather than funding organisations and services, we're funding people. We're resourcing people and citizens in a republic. I want to I want to allude to the very important piece of research carried out by Inclusion Ireland, which I know was featured on this week in relation to the crisis in speech and language therapy. And there has been one. There is one. Um, I see it in my own county. I see it all over the country. And it's. It's easy to explain. When you have a blanket moratorium in place, and every time 
you have a professional who takes maternity leave, who goes on a career break, anything that they're perfectly entitled to do, but that that system then has to battle so hard to get a derogation to fill that post. And weeks go by while you're seeking that derogation and waiting lists back up. We have to look at the moratorium. It's something that I'm hopeful and expect government will look at. We can't go back to the past of having no controls on public service numbers that you know you can just increase public service numbers or that you can make employment figures look good by just pumping a load of people onto public service payrolls. You can't go back to that system. But we've got to identify as a government how do we move beyond a blanket moratorium and target areas in the public service that need an increase. And I think there is a compelling case beyond all doubt that speech and language therapy in this country is at a crisis point. We have many really, really good professionals in, in the public sector element of it and in the private sector element. They're at their wits end, parents are at their wits end, and I'd certainly hope that this is an issue the government needs to address um, as we look at moving beyond moratorium and towards a campaign of targeted recruitment in the public service. I do want to just allude to some of the positives, because there have been positives in a very difficult number of years. We now have a situation where for the first time ever in this country, we have independent regulated assessments of residential facilities for people with disabilities. And there's been a bit of media commentary about them, which I think is somewhat unfair. I think when you start the process of inspection and it's not done in an adversarial way, you expect to identify challenges. You expect to set targets for residential service providers. You expect to find problems to be overcome. But I think by pulling back the curtain and sending in HICWA, to scrutinize these services. It's something that we've been doing in nursing homes, it's something we're doing in childcare providers. Why shouldn't we be doing it in disability residential services? That's now happening. We have the assisted decision-making bill now published. Today, as I stand here, we are governed in relation to the legal issue of capacity under the Lunacy Act of 1798. It's a disgusting word, but it's the legal position. Today, if you're in front of a court, if you're interacting with the state, we're governed by the Lunacy Act. 1798. We've now published the Assistant Decision-Making Bill, a massive piece of the jigsaw that needs to be passed and put into, leg put into law before we can get on with signing the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. That's a piece of work that is ongoing, it's before the Oireachtas, it's published, it's there for you to review, there's been significant consultation and it will be law during the term of this government. We've carried out, as I said, the first review of special needs education in 20 years, where we're now, and this is a point that I, I do feel strongly on, I accept fully the point that the voices of people with disabilities aren't often heard um, and often we, we talk to people who work with people with disabilities rather than talking directly to people with disabilities, which isn't acceptable. But I think the review of special needs education has changed that and I think if you look at the structure of the people inputting into that review and the implementation plan, we're hearing from people living with the impacts of special needs education. We need to have a discussion about SNAs. Um, yes, numbers of SNAs are important, but so is the criteria for accessing one. Is it acceptable? And I pose these as questions rather than attempting to claim to know all the answers. Is it acceptable that we have SNAs in our school system purely to deal with behavioural needs, when we now have a number of children in our school system who don't have behavioural needs but need that extra support? So every time we increase the numbers by a couple of hundred, every politician, myself included, welcomes it. But again, isn't this a superficial debate? Shouldn't we be looking at what the role of the SNA is? How do you access an SNA? And when you access an SNA, what is the job description for that SNA? We're moving towards publishing the first autism strategy. Uh, before my appointment as Minister of State of the Department of Finance, the Taoiseach had tasked myself and some other government TDs with trying to pull together an autism strategy. So for the first time ever, when the National Disability Strategy is published, we should have specific actions targeted at autism. Again, a disability that all too often in this country has been dismissed, has been poo-pooed. You've had people trying to kind of claim it, 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 it's just bad parenting. We've had all of this as a family. Um, you know, you're walking through the supermarket and the child throws a tantrum and you hear the smart comment of, oh, can't you keep your child under control? There's an ignorance around this area. There's an ignorance within the public service at times. And it's something we have to try and overcome. We have the value for money review, which is for the first time doing exactly as I said, looking at how do we spend money. Because yes, we need to spend more money, but before we spend more money, shouldn't we check where we're spending it? And we have the review of the DCA. Um, is, it, is it right and is it acceptable that at the age of 16, if you're a child with a disability and you're in full-time education, you have to claim the disability allowance? You have to sign a sheet of paper saying you have a disability and you're not able for work. You can be called before a panel to be assessed for your ability to work when you're not eligible to work. You're in school. You're a child in this country. And yet if you don't sign that, 
you lose that safety net of the DCA. So there are serious policy questions that government has to grapple with. And, and I look forward to playing my part in giving a voice to some of these issues. But my challenge for this conference, for government, for myself, for media, and in the run-up to the next election, for all people who will be knocking on doors and engaging in discourse about people with disabilities, is let's have a real debate about the real issues. Let's recognise that funding's an element, but let's recognise that funding without appropriate structures is not, the, is not a holistic answer. And I want to say that I, I really admire the work done by Inclusion Ireland. I think you always take a very constructive approach in the engagements that I've had and the publications that I've read. You don't just come with a list of the, the problems of which there are many, but you come with a list of suggested solutions to those challenges. Uh, I think this is really timely. Like I say, we are now in a space with the growing economy, with the troika gone, with the fire put out, to ask what do we do with the recovery? And let's not squander it. Thank you very much.